Good evening. Welcome to the Longmont Museum. We're a center for culture in northern Colorado where people of all ages explore history, experience art, and discover new ideas through dynamic programs, exhibitions, and events. My name is Justin Veach. I'm the manager of the museum, Stewart Auditorium, and I curate public programs. Who's here for the very first time in the history of their own lives? Oh, wow, newbies. Well, I like to say that you're not, your lives will never be the same. There's uh, you know, pre-Longmont Museum and then there's post-Longmont Museum. You're in that post period. A lot of us remember those days, heady days. Anyway, I want to thank all the folks who make our programming possible, the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, the Stewart Family Foundation, the Friends of the Longmont Museum, our many donors, and of course, our museum members. Do we have any museum members with us? I had a feeling, I just had the sense that we had members in the audience. Thank you. Uh, we simply can't do all that we do without you, so thanks. Um, if you're interested in, in finding out what it means to be a member, grab one of those people who raised their hand or stop by the front desk or pull me aside and I'm sure we'll tell you just about everything you ever needed to know. Um, tonight's program is being offered as part of our Thursday nights at the museum series. Every Thursday evening, we offer a, a little something for everyone. Uh, tonight, it's a panel. We offer films, uh, performances, concerts, you name it. Um, this particular program is being offered in conjunction with our current exhibition, Duality. And it's a real blockbuster. I hope you've all seen it. Who hasn't seen it yet? Oh, well, you're, you're going to have to check this out. Um, it's really kind of a blockbuster exhibition. I totally recommend it. Tell your friends. Um, what else? Uh, tomorrow, actually not tomorrow, but next week, next Thursday, we have a great uh, indigenous uh, poetry reading fe featuring um, Adrian Criso, uh, Chris uh, Crisosto Apache, and uh, Manny Lowley. They're all fantastic poets. That's next Thursday. Um, more information in our newsletter. Feel free to grab one on your way out the door. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, the curator of exhibitions here at Long the Longmont Museum, Jared Thompson, and our panel. And our panel. Here they are. So I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Jared Thompson. I'm the curator of exhibitions here at the Longmont Museum. Um, I worked with Greg on the Duality exhibition. Unfortunately, he could not join us tonight. But what we're trying to do with this goal is bring other voices into our gallery. Instead of having museum curators decide what the community sees, we want to bring artists in and for the interpretation for this gallery, we wanted their voices on the walls instead of a white in curator interpretation of the art. So we actually did interviews with them. So all of the gray labels are actually from those interviews. Um, the exhibition closes May 21st, so please tell your friends and family about it. So I'm really honored to have these artists with us. On the far end is Danielle Seawalker. So she's Hunkpapa Lakota and a citizen of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in North Dakota. She's an artist, writer, activist, and boy mom of two based in Denver, Colorado. Her visual artwork often incorporates the use of mixed media and experimentation while incorporating traditional Native American materials, scenes, and messaging. Her artwork pays homage to her identity as a Lakota woman and her passion to redirect the narrative to an accurate and insightful representation of contemporary Native America while still acknowledging historical events. Alongside her passion for creating visual art, Danielle is a freelance writer and recently published her first book titled Still Here, a past to present insight of Native American people and culture. She is also very dedicated to staying connected and involved in her native community and currently serves as co-chair for the Denver American Indian Commission. Danielle has also been working on a personal passion project since 2013 with her longtime friend called the Red Road Project. The focus of the work is to document through words and photographs 
what it means to be Native American in the 21st century by capturing inspiring and positive stories of people and communities within Indian country. She does have a show coming up in Amsterdam at the Strat Museum, so if you're in Amsterdam, definitely check it out. <laughs> she's doing a show at History Colorado in October, and she's also curating an all-women indigenous show at Artworks in Loveland that also in, opens in October. So she's incredibly busy. <laughs> Next, we have J.C. Bial. He grew up in the Four Corners area of New Mexico and receives his BFA in printmaking from the University of New Mexico. He is now based in Denver, Colorado. In addition to co-curating exhibitions, producing events, including an, an annual indigenous arts fair, Biel frequently travels to collaborate with fellow artists and commissioning organizations throughout the Southwest on murals and other projects. Biel's connection to his Aboriginal culture is grounded in his artistic practice. His personal identity, background, and pride is who he is and where he comes from have always been at the heart of his work. Bial's career as an, artist, as an artist began with his discovery of street art and graffiti. Using a combination of spray paints and acrylics, he celebrates the fusion of technology with indigenous culture, primarily in paintings and murals. Bial's work is deeply influenced by music. While the combination of traditional indigenous ideologies with his Buddhist practice is equally important to his art making, through which he strives to illuminate core concepts and convictions, the laws of movement, unity, and impermanence. He is an artist in residence at the Redline Contemporary Art Center. So check out their website. They will have shows coming up featuring his artwork. Chelsea Kaya is next to me. She's a Ute and Apache and also Irish descent, born on the Northern Ute Reservation. As an artist, she currently resides in Denver, Colorado. She is a passionate activist for native rights, awareness, and sustainability. She earned her BFA at Watkins College of Art and Design in Nashville, Tennessee. Today, she learns traditional practices of pine needle weaving, beading, porcupine quilling, buffalo hunting, and hide work, incorporating her interdisciplinary skills to meld a perspective of culture and artistic practice. Storytelling has always been an integral part of her upbringing. Storytelling is a connection to her relations, community past, and hopes for the future. Even objects that just carry belongings, such as hide bags, become cultural carriers that bring knowledge by creation and carriers of visual storytelling. Adapting traditional materials and techniques to engage a mindful space for honoring subjects that discuss resilience, mental health, system reformation, and means of healing. Traditional work becomes more than tradition. It becomes cultural experience. Chelsea presents human forms often masked to have ambiguity if it's her world, their world, or for viewers to reflect themselves in our world. She believes reflecting the human condition is an important connection to reignite nature-based relationships between cultural and physical environments. So she is upcoming show at the Pentamente Gallery in Philadelphia, opening in May. Um, please give a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> so we're gonna start with a slideshow with each artist. Chelsea's gonna begin. So, I am also a Redline resident artist, um, newly added in November, so I'll be there for the next two years, so you can really easily find my studio if you're ever in the area. Um, this is recent work. Um, this was at the annual Redline resident artist show, um, and I really wanted to experiment with not only the newly found space that I had for my Redline studio, but also um, being able to have the uh, opportunity for a gallery space to experiment a bit more with um, what I usually do, which is beadwork. Um, so my sculpture work, if you look at the detail, um, is a metal armature and in between the two metal um, armatures are woven uh, porcupine quills um, tacked onto deer hide. Um, so I really wanted to experiment and have a project where I'm really focusing on 
natural specific ways to dye quills, which ones are compatible, as well as present quills as this like main factual statement of the design. Because um, I feel like a lot of quill work is kind of presented in a traditional way that um, you see behind like glass in museums with a barrier and then um, you know you don't really get to like physically see it and I was actually encouraging people to kind of like swipe their fingers across it and that's what happens with my work a lot. Um, I actually encourage um, tactile touch and interaction. Um, I also make bags a lot so I mean like I encourage people to wear them and I wear them myself. Um, so it just kind of becomes this like, you know, once you, once you start touching things and once you're able to interact with it, I think you're able to kind of make a connection to it a bit more um, that you usually aren't able to in a gallery. And you process your own porcupine quills, correct? Yeah, so my latest uh, quill project, I, uh, completely used from a harvested porcupine um, this past fall, and it's just, um, we call it roadkill gold. Um, it's, it quite literally is a race in our tribal area to get to the porcupine first, um, and I got it. So I was uh, really, really happy because um, it became, it's, it's, once I get into kind of these motions of working, it really becomes like a communal family thing. Um, so, and also a community thing. I mean, I, I donated a lot of quills recently to uh, teach some quill work classes to uh, Native community members. Um, so just even being able to like have an abundance and then, you know, offering it um, in gratitude to community of just even wanting to learn the, the skill work because it's so difficult and it's so um, laborious and hard to work with that if anyone has a passion for it, I'm like, here is everything. Like, let me encourage it as much as I can because um, it, it, it does take a type of person to learn it. Yeah. Um, so this piece, um, I also process a lot of uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm a hunter, um, I'm a hide worker, and then um, I'm an artist. So I really have been reflecting um, with my pieces, you know, like that reconnection to hide work. And this piece is actually based off from documentation of me holding a giant bison heart that took up like my whole torso. And I based, um, I, I just really love that image of me processing it, but also kind of like this cradling um, factor that I was doing while I was holding it. And I just um, looked at it and then uh, created this piece off from that documentation. So that's been really fun to kind of incorporate like my photography documentation video work back into like my beadwork pieces because they're obviously so different. Um, I didn't include the photo because like I like busted, like I was like five days into a camping trip with like no shower and just dirt roads. So um, it's not a cute photo, but it <laughs> created this. So it honestly, it's, um, it's really amazing to be able to have a full process. Yeah. Um, so this uh, piece is Jokovic, which is a coyote and ute. And I work a lot with like creation stories and I think, um, you know, kind of adapting them into, like, coyote is like a very significant, important part of a lot of uh, native storytelling. Um, and I really, and a lot of the baseline is like, there's this coyote, it's curious, it's mischievous, and then there's like these noble, like, obedient native people that are like, ideal, and then like me as a teen, I'm like, but that coyote is more relatable. Um, being mischievous and being curious and, you know, disrupting and, uh, you know, making issues for everyone. Um, I kind of related to that a bit more. And so I adapt a, the coyote head and figure a lot in my work um, as a mask. Uh, I never do kind of anamorphic things. I do more of like, it's a mask and then a person underneath. Um, 
because I really want to know and be able to storytell myself and explore the world as a woman um, embodying coyote. And so she's lightly caressing um, the old style beadwork, which is Apache, you know, that like diamond grid. And then uh, she's kind of exploring the world naked and just being free and uh, being expressive. And I think that's, you know, uh, a theme that you'll find a lot in my beadwork. Yeah, the same with uh, this. I, I definitely try with my beadwork to, um, you know, jut out figures, play um, with dimensions. Um, I think beadwork can kind of be presented flat sometimes. So just kind of putting in a little more dimension work and then uh, still working with that coyote figure. And then um, I also do a lot of sculpture work, so a lot of experimenting with like sculptures. Um, this is a piece that was at Friend of a Friend. Um, and I do a lot of like dual figures, um, but always kind of like a traditional material presented as well. So we have the Coquim scarf. Do you have a preferred media or do you like? I've been gravitating into hide work just because of the process of it, like the labor of it, like whatever's the worst thing for my body, super laborious, that's like what I wanna do. And it's a lot of work, but I think because it's so much labor and so much love, and then also handling this like beautiful animal, there's like so many connections that it creates for me that it um, is, is just like taking over my life right now. But I think it's a good thing. <laughs> and then this is the piece in the uh, gallery show. So, um, the epitome of the coyote head, uh, porcupine quills, um, the actual hide of the bag. So the construction is an antelope that I processed um, this past fall. And I really wanted to keep like the natural um, edges of the hide. And then if you like pick up the bag, which I don't think you can right now, don't touch the artwork at this gallery. But um, <laughs> if you pick it up and you turn it around, um, there's like the natural holes that I made during the process of making the hide. Um, I use bluebird flower bags in my, uh, to line my purse, purses, um, just because it's like the, the native thing to do, as well as uh, it's the same flower that my grandma used. So it's like a familiar material that I handle that directly I know, um, you know, my relatives have handled. So that lines the inside of the bag as well as um, my antelope. So it's just, it's kind of one of the first of its series where I'm using the natural hide that I've done and made and then utilizing it in my bag. Um, so it's a really special piece to me just for that. Um, yeah. And you got a grant to build a permanent smoke shed, right? Yeah. This is one of the first pieces. Mm -hmm. It was really important for me, for my practice, to have something that brings me back to my reservation and back to my family. And for me, that's also hide work. Um, so my smoke shed is on my grandpa's property. Um, and it like sits smack dab in his garden. Um, and it's really nice to s spend space spend more time there again. Um, so it's like a really special connection to be in his place again, um, cleaning it up and then tending to it and having like active, activeness there again. So yeah. Um, and then this is me there as well. So this is me processing the bison hide that we got this year. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the grant has been amazing. Um, I'm really grateful for the Native Arts and Cultural Foundation. It's a really amazing foundation. So yeah, they support a lot of artists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So now we're gonna move on to JC. <laughs> we're there. I'm not a hunter. I just <laughs> drive to the art store, get all my stuff. I'm not as cool as you. You know, super easy. Just get in the car and go over there. I don't win porcupines quills, though. Like, not a whole lot of roadkill. Besides squirrels, she make like a pouch or something. Yeah. This light's super bright, too. Creator. Not yet. Stop. Don't go go home. Not yet. <laughs> I'm JC. That light's really bright, but um, I'll talk about my art. 
Um, so yeah, this is just a graphic design piece that I made for a show that Chelsea curated. So um, it was just a request of designing this poster. It was a limited edition poster that I made. It was actually a graphic I started like a year ago or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just like an offering, a blessing with the Sage Bundle and just kind of paying homage to the spirit world creator. Yep. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, and this one here is another graphic design. So I started out as a graphic designer, um, worked as, uh, I managed a silk screen and embroidery shop for years, but also learned how to really get into my artwork, uh, through screen printing. So uh, a lot of my work that I generated at that time was digital. So I use a lot of Adobe Illustrator. And um, still, to this day, I do. Um, that's my main job. Um, but this particular piece I designed in a collaboration with a company called Bandits. And uh, it's a bandana actually being sold at REI right now. So after this, get in your car, Thanks. go to REI, <laughs> see a porcupine, pick it up for Chelsea. You know, you can wrap it up in the yeah. bandana. Yeah, drop you know, it off at then, yeah, there you go. So, yeah, and then this stuff is. Uh, what I used to do, um, I promise I won't paint your house, um, <laughs> but if you want me to, I will. Um, graffiti is what I started doing as a kid when I was in third grade, um, and it's what got me into art. And uh, my good friend, Randy Saba, he says, graffiti saved my life. So, and I think he's right, because that's kind of what I did. So this was done pretty recently. So um, do continuously try to stay loose, have fun, not take my art too serious because I can and I will. And um, so yeah, just kind of participate in doing some little bit of graffiti. So something like this, do you like draw it out on the wall first or is it more free form? Are you gonna tell the cops? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, it's, it, this one, honestly, it was like free form. Like I just was like, I just called my friend. And I was like, hey man, like I wanna go paint something. Let's just go paint. And so it was like, all right, let's do this. So yeah, it was just kind of like on the spot. He came up with the color scheme. I was like, okay, I'll do that. So, and that's, this is what happened. Um, this one is a particular piece. This is the serious stuff I do. Um, so this is in kind of a, my communication of what the four worlds mean to the Navajo people. And, um, and it's a combination of those different worlds um, represented by each one of these canvases. Each one of these canvases is about maybe six feet wide by five feet tall. I oriented them in the cardinal directions, but also incorporated this basket design, um, which also has a lot of significance in um, our culture and tradition as Navajo people. So this is a pretty thoughtful piece, and I'm really happy with it because, again, just like the graffiti, this was like something I just did and was like I didn't have it planned out. A lot of my work, as you'll see as we progress, um, a lot of it's really clean and straight edge. Um, I still like to paint very clean, but this was really free form and being really more expressive of my application and technique. Um, so that way I'm not like fill in tight. I wanted to get loose. And this is just a detail of one of them. So this is the turquoise world. Um, Chelsea was talking about the coyote. This guy, you know, don't mess with them. No bueno. <laughs> Um, so this guy is jumping into this blue world, you know, because he escaped. And um, this particular world was ran by the sparrow people, which is a sparrow on the bottom right corner. And, um, and then, you know, just kind of a turquoise arrowhead with a turquoise feather, just again for ceremonial purposes, really thinking of that and paying um, homage to my, my um, uh, what is it, my father's side of my family. So just really paying um, respects to them for what they have done for me and helped me accomplish within my art. And then the lotus flower is just, a, again, a signifier of my Buddhist practice. Um, when I, let's see, when was this, 2013, 10 years ago, um, that's when I decided to get my life together. So uh, I decided to, like, not drink alcohol anymore and chose to be find something, find community to help me get myself on the track because I knew that I couldn't do it myself. Even though it's a self-will thing, it was up to me to try to make that happen and that's when I decided I'm gonna go make art and, and try to change things and recreate this will, which is a representation of what I um, was in the previous slide. So um, that's what that is. And then this speaks to that even more. Um, this is a sand painting um, that I, 
created in my studio at Redline. If you guys are ever in Denver, Chelsea and I have a studio there for the next two years. And um, shout out to Louise and the whole crew there for really supporting us and allowing us to, to be there for the next two years. And so if you guys are ever in Denver, drop by. Um, but yeah, this is a piece that I collaborated with my friend uh, Porfidia helped me um, get this done. We'd made it happen in seven hours. It was a hurtful seven hours and then a hurtful four days, you know. <laughs> so we, we really did go to ceremony on this one, you know. Um, so this is just kind of like an extension of continuing tradition when it comes to Navajo culture. You guys probably all know about the rug weaving, the sand paintings, and the jewelry that the Navajo people are most recognized for. Um, for me, it's more or less like I, I seen that stuff traditionally done and I seen it done as a commercial product to be sold and to maintain households. So um, I just kind of was like, I wanted to do something different. As you see, like I don't, I, I get bored with certain mediums. At the same time, like um, I want to be able to speak in different ways. And this is one of the ways that I have chosen to do so. And, um, and again, this is just a representation of kind of like a circle of life. You can see it looks like it's rotating um, and, and just becoming like this portal, a portal to the self and, um, and, and allowing people to experience that. And if you've gone to the one in here in the gallery, go and check it out. I'm not like Chelsea though, don't touch it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chelsea likes people touching her stuff, not me. Don't touch so it. yeah. We've had a lot of children enjoy touching yeah. JC's sand painting here, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been thinking about it, and, it's, and, it's a, and, and to me, it's, like, it's very important to me. It has a lot of significance, and that's what I'm saying. Some of my art is very serious. Some of it's very playful. Some of it's just like, whatever, let's just get it done. But I think with these in particular, it holds a lot of power for me. There's a lot of communication that's happening within these like, uh, sand paintings that I recognize as portals. And, um, and, and, and to me, also, it's a signifier. If people want to touch it, then to me, that's also communication of how, as Native people, we have to kind of protect ourselves and to clam up and not share these things because people can't respect it. So it's more or less like it's a conversation as well, how outsiders view these works, and they view it as art. Um, and to me, yes, it is art, but it's also very um, ceremonial in its purpose, and, and, and it's a guider like a compass and um, so for me it's more or less like how do we try to communicate and share who we are as native people without being obstructed on even more so um, if you think about it with colonialism like it's 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 about that it's like okay we want this and I'm just gonna do whatever I want and um, even though we built the fence mm. you know <laughs> we tried we tried but yeah and this is in Niwot so you guys know where that is down the road was commissioned by the city of Niwot to, to produce this work. And um, it's just my interpretation of Niwot. I'm not Arapaho. I'm not from this area. I'll, I'll be straight up, but um, I was glad that they asked. Um, Danielle participated in that um, little mural um, project as well. So this was just me kind of communicating and, and celebrating the Arapaho people who lived here way before any, of you, any one of us came here. So it was more or less like, how do I celebrate them, respect them, and, and show them like, yes, I'm, I'm not of your culture, I'm not of your background, but I'm willing to help communicate that in whatever way I possibly can. This was all done with spray paint too. Wow. Um, this is a print. So I went to school for printmaking, as he said earlier, so this is all a, a linoleum print. Um, so I'm trying to get back to that. You know, people ask me about buying prints of my paintings, but to me, it's like I can't do that because I went to school for like ever to make prints. So I might as well make it. Um, so, and again, just like Chelsea said, I like to torture myself too and make things really hard. So that's what I do, you know? Um, so yeah, this is just the print. So if you want one, you can buy some, you know? Um, this is uh, another mural I did in Denver. Um, this is, a, a, again, the Sand Hill Crane. Sand Hill Crane travels along the Platte River here in Colorado. Um, they hang out down near the, the sand dunes in southern Colorado, near Alamosa. So it was more or less like, um, 
acknowledging the animal life, the natural environment with this crane, um, but also recognizing it as a water bird because in uh, Native American church culture, um, the water bird has a huge significance and holds a lot of power. Um, again, because it's recognized with water, and we all need water to survive. And a lot of my work is a conversation about the protection and the conservation of water. And um, so like, that's why I painted this and I'm really grateful. And it's in, in a really nice place in Denver. So go check it out on Colfax. Um, this one here is, I did at the Dairy Art Center in Boulder. It's another mural painted by hand with a brush. Um, the crane mural was done by hand with the brush too. So this was just kind of uh, um, my piece in recognition of missing and murdered indigenous relatives. And um, I normally don't paint in um, relation to different issues that affect native people because I feel like what I'm trying to communicate is the beauty of the culture and the strength and the power of the culture. And, and I wanna focus on that and, and allow people to experience that. Even though like, yes, these things happen, um, I want to just be able to jump in there every so often and peek in and then jump right back out. So this was my um, reference in relation to that. But I think, you know, missing and murdered indigenous relatives kind of starts with our planet and how we treat our planet, our mother, our first and foremost mother. Um, so that's kind of where I kind of stem this project from and what it communicated for me was relation to recognizing Mother Earth and how we treat her first and foremost is how we're gonna respect and treat our women. So this one is done in Boulder at Twitter. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you guys feel about Twitter. <laughs> kind of touchy, yeah, you know? For sure. Sorry I did it, but this was before all this stuff went down. Um, so yeah. I, I try, actually tried to go back there one day. They wouldn't let me in. Huh. Yeah, I know. I was like, bro, I'm just like right there. I painted that. Elon yeah, so anyway, that's kind of what that was. I painted that guy there at Twitter, and then these are kind of other pieces I painted for a show I had up at CSU in Fort Collins. Um, I think that's it, right? Yeah, so you can see these are very geometric, very expressive, um, kind of in relation to graffiti with the color usages and stuff. So, yeah. Nice. I think I've talked way too much. Okay. We both did. It's okay. Danielle? Hello. <laughs> um, I'm sort of in the middle of what Chelsea and JC do. I, do a, I work with porcupines. I work with animal hides. I do murals. I paint on canvas. So I do a lot. We're, we're all very multidisciplinary. And just watching these two and their work, I get so inspired. That's what inspires me is like my peers or other artists. I get so inspired. I'm ready to go to my studio and paint now. <laughs> Um, so I do a lot of, um, I'm working, I've been working on a series now for almost two years, and this was, this is one of them, um, and it's, it's very expressionistic for me, it was, it, um, uh, these came to me from a dream I had, and if it, the duality, um, I think cover shot or catalog photo is also a piece of mine, it's the two women, and, um, the one eye with the scribbles on the face is kind of the signature of this series I've been working on, and it was based on a dream I had, this one is called Reaka. And it's, um, that means hostage. And I do create a lot of um, pieces centered around issues. JC is the beauty and I'm like, nope, we're gonna go right into it and I'm gonna bring these issues to light because we need to talk about them. So I um, did this one based on um, prisoners. Native Americans have one of the, we're one of the highest populations that are in prison despite us being the lowest population percentage in comparison to the rest of the US. So I wanted to sort of, um, bring to light this. The hair um, is made from letters that I wrote um, back and forth to Leonard Peltier, if anybody's familiar. Does anybody know who Leonard Peltier is? So um, he's a considered a political prisoner. He's Lakota like I am. Um, and so I wanted this piece to be kind of centered around that. And um, my father was imprisoned at one point, and that really um, had a huge impact on my life. So I wanted to kind of do this piece in homage of that. Um, this is a mural that I did in Denver. Um, one thing I really love about 
uh, doing mural pieces is I kind of do it differently than my studio practice. I do these very kind of bold, vi um, colorful murals that are more centered around what's happening in the piece versus about the detail or the skill of the work. So a lot of, I get a lot of questions about my murals, like why doesn't your people have faces? Or you know, why is there lack of detail, et cetera? Um, and it's, it's really kind of goes back to um, something called winter counts from my tribe where the way we document it, we didn't have a written language up until just very recently and it's still kind of controversial teaching a, a, a written language because we always taught orally. But the way that we documented our histories was by drawing. So we're just naturally um, a, a kind of an artistic community and people. I'm not professionally trained, I'm a self-taught artist. I come from a family of um, self-taught artists. And so um, I do a lot of work based on those winter counts, which if you look at it, were historically done on deer hide or buffalo hide. Um, and they're very, very simplistic drawings. Some may say, oh, that looks like stick drawings, but really it's about what's going on in that piece and what's, what the story is. Um, versus about the skill of the, the person that created it. So a lot of my work is based on, is kind of a contemporary version of what we call ledger art or winter counts. Um, and I wanted, this piece is called Still Here. And it's really to um, show that we're still here. We can, you know, wear our traditional regalia, hop on a skateboard, wear our baseball cap with our moccasins. We very much live in this duality or two worlds, right? Um, so that's a piece in, in Denver by the Central Market. This is another mural that I did um, that is all about our ancestors, that we are our ancestors, and we have to acknowledge that and sort of pay that forward. And then, you know, one day we will become ancestors, so we have to leave this human earth better than we found it for our future generations. Um, I love working in schools. I actually am lined up to do a few more murals in schools coming up, and this one was done in North High School. It's one of the high schools in Denver that has the highest population of brown kids. Um, including indigenous children. And I, you know, they, they asked me if I'd be coming, willing to do a mural, and I said, absolutely, 100%. Um, so I did uh, the cafeteria, and on those, there's different poles or, or pillars in the cafeteria, and there's four sides, the four sides um, have geometric designs and also bigger than life figures, kind of going back similar to those figures you saw in the other mural that depict those children, whether they're um, two-spirited or LGBTQ, as a colonized version would say, um, or they're proud athletes or graduates, et cetera. I wanted it to be reflective of those that student body and have them be proud. I, I reflect back in my childhood, I never saw public art that referenced me, my culture, what I looked like, things that I was proud of. And so I wanted to kind of pay that forward for those kiddos. Um, this is a, a more recent piece I did. It's called Not Today, Cowboy. Um, and it's uh, part of that series with kind of that one eye, realistic eye, and then sort of this two-dimensional flat rest of the piece. Um, and it really is all about storytelling, similar to what, you know, these two artists next to me. Storytelling is a big part of our cultures. And um, I always grew up, I grew up in North Dakota. I'm from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in North Dakota. And we had, um, a lot of, I grew up with a lot of stories about the cowboys that came and colonized that area. And a lot of them would take uh, native women as wives, sometimes multiple wives, and um, they would ha or they would have children with them, then leave them and kind of discard these women. So I sort of wanted to flip the narrative and have this, wo this native woman be like, no, 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 I'm in charge and you know I'm taking back this narrative, so not today, cowboy. Um, another piece that I did recently is, um, this is called Uncle Giving Directions. Um, and it's based off, old, old, old photographs really, really inspire me. I could sit all day and just look at old photos. And this is based off an old photo of a, an elder. And I sort of made it my own and depicted it in my own way, added long braids. And it's kind of a running joke in, our, in our, many of our cultures that we point without pointing. So we like, we don't, you know, it's very invasive to be like, hey, look at that. So we, you know, we point with our lips over there, you know, or so I wanted to sort of do this with the braid that he's sort of giving directions with his <laughs> braid. Um, this piece is about boarding schools. And um, if anybody's familiar with that, it's been something that's come up more in a, in a general public way the last few years than ever so before. It's not new to any of us sitting on this stage. Um, I don't know one Native person that hasn't been affected by boarding schools, um, whether it was our parents, our grandparents that had to attend these schools. Um, but this one's called You Can't Have Our Braids, and it um, kind of 
reflected back to a time when my grandma, who was a boarding school student um, at a Catholic school in South Dakota, told me she, she barely ever spoke about her experiences there. It was super painful. Um, but she told me that she, at one point, they had, they, when she first got there, they scrubbed her with lye, and then um, they cut her hair. And so, because I remember when I was a little girl, she was um, just this cute little old lady, and I'd be like, Grandma, what, you know, you still braid your hair in two long braids. And she said, yeah, I'll always have long braids, um, because when I went to school, they cut my braids. So I sort of did that piece in, in remembering that conversation I had with her. This one is called Erasure, and it's sort of a um, kind of, my art is very much my diary. I haven't started showing my art publicly until 2020, so I'm sort of recent to this, but I've been creating art since forever. Um, and this one is really about the censorship that we as Native people often face in media, in um, agencies, in public places. We're so, I'm so grateful today to be on this stage and be sharing this space with you all. Like I would say maybe a generation ago, you wouldn't really see Native people up here like this talking in such a freeform way because of the censorship and the erasure. And um, so that's what kind of what this piece is about. This one is um, of a, he's my adopted uncle. His name's Patrick Killscrow. He's a resident of Denver. He's an elder in my community and also from the same tribe that I am. And I just love him so much and I was felt so compelled to paint a portrait of him in the way that I do. Um, and I remember him looking at it being like, what's that? <laughs> Uh, a lot of people don't understand it or they question like kind of my aesthetic, but again, this is my diary. This is so much more different than my mural work. Um, my studio work is so much more intimate and just free flowing, but um, he's such a sweetheart and he's, you know, in his 70s and still has a full-time job. He doesn't drive. He relies on people to, you know, get a, he gets a cab or whatever, but he is so passionate about helping other elders in our community in Denver um, that he drives food boxes to his peers. When I'm like, you're an elder yourself people should be coming and bringing you a food box, but that's what he does, and I just adore him so much, so I wanted to honor him in the only way that I know how, and that's by painting him. Similar to um, the stories that these two have about Coyote, we have somebody called Deer Woman, and that's somebody you definitely don't want to cross. Um, I grew up with stories about Deer Woman and how she sort of lurks at powwows, and you know, when a man is asked to dance with, a, or a woman asks to, a man to dance, you gotta like look, pull up her skirt a little bit, make sure there's no hooves under there. Um, because she sort of is known to keep men in check. And um, so this is my interpretation of Dear Woman. Uh, another mural that I did, I did this in honor of um, Pride Month in Adams County. I'm, I'm um, one of the um, organizers or leaders of Bay Balls. If anybody's heard of Bay Balls, it's an all-women non-binary mural festival. And so I'm part of that organization. And last year we did one in Adams County. We did Pride, and we paired up with um, uh, artists that were that are identify as LGBTQ or Two Spirited. And I um, wanted to paint this one in honor of that. Uh, this one is my. This was my second mural I ever did. So I've only paint. I've only started doing murals since 2020, and since then I've done probably 25 murals. This was my very second one I did, and it's at the Denver Indian Center. And I did it during COVID. So. Thank you. So we're going to save about 15 minutes at the end of this for uh, audience questions. So if you guys want to think of some questions before that. So I'm going to ask you guys a couple questions. What challenges have you faced as Native artists in predominantly non-Native art world? I mean, the ethics of how I create my materials comes up a lot, um, mostly from people that are genuinely curious, but I've also gotten some, you know, sly comments um, from like vegans or something, um, which I'm like, I totally respect your lifestyle, but I also would appreciate the same. Um, the truth is, is like, you know, we do hunt the animals, um, but how we do it and how we respect them and how we bless them is so much more ethical. And um, the way that I am able to track this animal, I'm able to um, 
then take care of this animal, live off of this animal for us the year, and then turn this animal into artwork is way more of an ethical lifestyle than like the industrial system of like how we normally get our meat, which is like such a system and no love or care goes into it. Um, and it, it, there's so many blessings that go into, um, you know, the, the whole process of what I'm doing, you know, blessing the animal before we even touch it, um, blessing the animal, like, while I'm working on it, cleansing my studio, you know, it, there's just so many layers of, like, respect and love that I love to show um, the animal that I'm working with, and uh, I think it's, like, a barrier of, like, um, not a lot of people know this process. They don't know the labor that goes into learning uh, hide work. They don't know like the love and respect that we have for this animal. So there's like a lot of barriers that kind of um, people put up. So it's kind of, it's something that I'm loving challenging um, and showing people and breaking down those barriers. And, and especially in the art world, I mean, there's, the, it's, once you start talking about hunting in the art world, it's just kind of, <laughs> it's like an interesting conversation, mm -hmm. so, yeah. JC or Danielle, are there any challenges you'd like to discuss? Um, no, go ahead, do the next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's one. How do you decide when a piece of art is finished and what criteria do you use to evaluate your work? Uh, I'll answer that question. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm a perfectionist. I'll be straight up. Like, um, I want my stuff to look really clean. I want it to be presentable. Um, I think it has to be with how I was raised and how I w what I was taught by my mother and my father. And, um, and just the care and respect for what I produce. Um, I, I feel like if anything were to ever happen, I want it to have like, that essence of who I am. And, um, and I think, you know, the perfectionism does get, get to me where I don't know when something's done um, because I want it to be great. I want it to be amazing. So it's like you just keep pushing yourself to keep going there. And, and I think when it comes to perfectionism, um, it's not a bad thing because you're always pushing yourself. And, and for me, that's how I view it. Um, some people may think I'm crazy or I'm nuts, um, but... Maybe I am, that's fine, but uh, I think like for me it's, it's more or less like, again, the care and, and the effort and the energy and the spirit that I put into my work is, is how I want it to be felt and mm -hmm. seen. So, and it's really hard to say when something's done, for sure. All right, Danielle, how do you balance your personal vision with the expectations and demands of the art market and your audience? repeat that like three more times <laughs> so how do you balance your personal vision like, okay. with expectations and demands of the art market and your audience yeah that's a good question I when you asked a question about the challenges we face I kind of was thinking about this and this is probably a more suitable answer for this question I recently was asked to be part partaking in a show that was like about Western art and um, I was like, okay, and I, they were like, can you send us some samples of your work? And so I did, and they were like, this is not Western art. And I'm like, well, how do you define Western art or a native art? I'm Native American, therefore this is native art. This is part of what we, I guess, Western art. So um, I, you know, I always stay true to my vision. I always stay true to who I am as an artist, and I will never ever, I don't take commissions very rarely, unless maybe a mural, it's different, but um, I get asked a lot about commissions for paintings, et cetera. I never take commissions because I always, um, I don't want to have to live up to somebody else's expectation on what they want. I want to create what I want, what makes me feel good, and, uh, and then put it out into the universe. So I kind of just approach it that way. Mm -hmm. All right, this question is for any of you. How do you guys balance using traditional indigenous art forms with exploring new and contemporary techniques? I, um, I always, always think about the traditional art forms, whether it's quill work, working with beads or leather, um, even like hand dyeing things using berries or like natural dyes um, or making my own paints or pigments. Um, but I also love to balance and bring it into the 21st century and like of today. So I, a lot of my colors, um, I have a very au palette. 
So it's a very contemporary way that I like to approach. Uh, my work is very colorful and lots of like contemporary colors. So I would say um, I sort of mixed that with mine. Do you see your Chelsea, do you want to add anything? Um, I would definitely agree with that. Like, I think um, I was Native Arts Artist in Residence at the Denver Art Museum, and part of my opportunity there was to be able to go into the collections and, like, actually handle, like, really old um, beadwork for my tribes. And part of my main factor and want and goal of um, doing that is not only documentation, like, seeing the stitch work, how it's assembled, um, and, you know, just like admiring the designs and stuff, but also being able to document it and bring um, color palettes um, into my work and then represent it in my work and have kind of make goals of like trying to find a specific type of greasy bead or, you know, there's, there's so many ways that um, we adapt and I think you know, it's it's so amazing to be able to traditionally do uh, work and skill work that we haven't been able to and that even my parents weren't able to, but now I'm able to, you know, just like fully embrace it. And so that's like my main mindset is like, I get to learn all this traditional work. I It's such a privilege and it's such a honor to be able to study works um, and then bring them into my dialect and be able to reflect it um, how I do as artists. So um, it can just be in the simplest ways, but it can also be um, in very gestural, meaningful ways um, like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have time for about one more question, then we'll open it up to the audience. So JC, how do you maintain your creative energy and motivation over time? Especially I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's it's a balance, you know, because I have a I have a day to day job too. But I'm a graphic designer for an organization called Indian Collective, so work nationwide and um, in Canada and South America with various tribes from all over. So um, a lot of that feeds my creative process, even though it takes away from my creative process in my studio at times. I still feel like what I'm generating is, is significant and important just as much as the work that I create because I'm helping my people in that way. And um, if you guys haven't heard of them, look them up. They're awesome. And, um, and I think, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's more or less like um, really taking the time. Um, I'm, I, I like to work all the time, mm -hmm. and which is bad because um, I don't know how to take a break and just chill out. Mm -hmm. And um, so... But I think, you, you know, for, for me, it's more or less like I, I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So it becomes a sanctuary, it becomes a vibe, and it, it is fun. And, and then sometimes you just go on a different level. So it's more or less like hitting that vibration and staying consistent with it and just allowing yourself the time and space to work with it. But to remember to just kind of chill a little bit, um, which is the hardest part. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm sure these guys can relate because that's how it is. And I think, yeah. you know, um, time management, yes, is a thing. Um, but what is time, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, my gosh, JC. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, yeah, so, like, yeah, that's what I do. I just, I just try to just vibe out as much as possible. Yeah. Do any of you ever suffer from, like, creative blocks? And do you have techniques to kind of get through those? I don't get artist block. Um, I think there's like several ways that artists can do that to make sure that they don't, which is mostly having just like multiple forms of uh, expression. So like if I'm not into beading, I'll go to my sketchbook work or even like then I can like translate into like a poem or I'll go out to take photos. Like that is all part of a process and that can be adapted into your foundation and your practice. Like there's no reasons, rhymes, really to like get stuck in your head when there's like technically so many options in our modern day to like be able to adapt and express. Um, and that is such an important part about being like a full-time artist, being a creative constantly, 
having creatives around you, being in a constant mindset, you have to be able to um, continue on and move on from an idea if it's not working out or um, just have, in general, like I have so many projects lined in front of me more so than I'm like getting done. Um, but I think like just generating that constant content of um, expression is just like such an important way not to get stuck and it's such a valid way to continue on in an art career and make sure it's like solid and stable. JC or Danielle, do you want to add anything? I definitely have like at least five paintings sitting in my studio unfinished that I have been sitting there for probably a few years that I got a block from. But kind of like what Chelsea said, I, I, I'm a writer as well, so I'll like write a book or I'll write it <laughs> or I'll do a sketch or hey, I maybe have a mural project coming up. So it's just a matter of like keeping moving and like flowing between different mediums and um, getting it out in different ways. All right, we're gonna open it up to the audience for questions. Anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Yes. Um, so I had my residency already. Um, so a new resident is coming in. Um, and I mean, the main part of my benefit was exploring the collections as well as, um, you know, figuring out how to interact with visitors, um, the challenges in that way. But the new wing is amazing. I mean, there's like whole collections of families, ancestral pottery, all the way to like contemporary times. Um, that's uh, Roxanne and Rose Simpson's uh, family's like Pueblo pottery heritage. And that's just like such an amazing display that you're not gonna be able to see represented anywhere else like in America or in the world. So it's just like amazing to be able to like reflect on uh, lineages as well as uh, ancestrally, culturally, like the tribes that I come from. So it was amazing to go in there, look at palettes, look at designs, look at um, you know how stitching is made. So like I was looking at cradle boards and seeing uh, turning it around in the back, and then looking at the stitching, and that was um, a main thing. I mean, just even the construction of how items are done is kind of um, visually lost sometimes. So it's really nice to go in there and have the opportunity to look. Um, but yeah, I, it, my residency was basically a continuation of what I do at Redline um, with the barrier of not being able to bring in animal products. So that was a weird thing. Um, so I mostly focused on what I was saying with uh, not getting artist blocks. So I'm like constantly giving myself um, imagery, sketches, color palettes, um, and gathering this collection, this atlas of work influence from the art museum to be able to fuel my studio at Redline and ideas that are gonna happen um, in the future and later on. So it was, all, it was all relevant and I was doing very different things in both studios, but yeah, now I'm just full-time at Redline um, and I'm able to use my quills and my hides um, there. So that's good. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So the question is, how, how many quills do you get off a porcupine? Well, mine, my porcupine, people kept running it over. So it was like <laughs> mostly like the lower back half of it. Um, so I was able to harvest from like the underbelly and the tail, which is like actually probably like the best quills as well. So um, I was able to gather that half and that supplied like uh, 40 people learning basic quilling and like giving them a small amount as well as making the sculpture pieces um, up there and then I still have um, a pretty decent sized box of them and that's just from 
like a, basically a quarter of the porcupine. Um, but Danielle was able to harvest a whole porcupine from the Denver, uh, it was the zoo? The zoo. Um, so they donated the whole porcupine to um, Danielle and she also hosts quill work classes. So I, I think there's like 30,000 like. Yeah, um, for there's thir between 30 and 40,000 quills on a porcupine. And do you just pull them out? Like, what's the process? Yeah, you have to sort of let it rot. So, like in Chelsea's case, it was already rotting. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, when I when the when I found out that the that quill, the resident porcupine at the zoo, had passed away, I immediately called my contacts at the zoo and I was like, "What are you going to do with it? Can I have that bo um, the quills?" And they they were like, "Well, it might have already went to the." I found out that they incinerate the animals, which is so sad to me. Um, and I, I explained, you know, what I was doing and the quill work projects and things that I've been working on with the community and um, they let us come in and, and I, we sh were taught or I had an elder come in and lead that class uh, or the, the process of harvesting the quills, but we had to let the body rot for a few days because then the quills come out much more smoother. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, and yeah. we're going to donate a piece. We're working as a community to create a piece together that we're going to donate back to the zoo using his quills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the back. So how do you see Denver evolving as a center for native art? Yeah. Well, I actually just visited like Santa Fe and Albuquerque for the first time um, a few months ago to participate in like Greg Deal's, um, or not Greg Deal, um, uh, man, I'm sorry, Jeffrey Gibson, um, in one of his performances. And it was um, such a beautiful contrast, like Jeffrey Gibson is an idol to me and uh, seeing the contrast of like this forced narrative that also like Santa Fe and Albuquerque sometimes puts on native folk. Um, I think Denver has a good, uh, you know, idea of like, we don't wanna force that narrative on native folk. Um, we wanna create these spaces for them to express themselves, um, how they do and what they do and the skill work that they work in. Um, but that's not to say that it's like all PG can. I think there's still some strives that we can make as an art community to, um, you know, include native artists without like the native part. Like we're just artists. And I think like Danielle and JC were commenting on that as well. Like we also just want to be, um, you know, how we are and artists and not just in native exhibitions. But for now, like I will take every opportunity um, to be in native exhibitions to show that representation but hopefully eventually it's not just designated like you're in this niche stay in there you know i feel like santa fe and albuquerque is so heavy southwest influenced as a tribe from the north i love denver being sort of the crossroads of indian country as we call it where we have a lot of tribes from the north and a lot of tribes from the south and we're sort of this melting pot so you see a lot more um a wide array of, of different Native American and indigenous artworks and art forms, whereas South, so I feel like in Santa Fe and all that, it's so heavy pottery and jewelry, which I absolutely love, but you get a bit more of, of a broader mix up here. Yeah. Any other questions? So yeah, porcupine quilling is more like weaving. You don't actually, um, you know, penetrate the quill with like needle and thread. You're kind of weaving the quill in between the thread spaces that you make. Um, and I always call it kind of like when teaching it or something, like I call it more porcupine weaving than um, anything because it's more about the stitching that you're doing underneath with the thread and then weaving the quill. Um, it's really hard and that's part of the barrier of teaching quill works. It really has to be in person because describing it in words is um, 
really weird because it involves like me putting it in my mouth and flattening it and then you know like it's just it sounds like a weird process but it's such a beautiful process um and then dyeing it um my rule of thumb is they really love acid baths so um they love like that vinegar and they like soak it up and then um usually if it is if silk is adapted to it then um porcupines will also be compatible with whatever works on silk because they're both like animal products so um, that's usually my rule of thumb if I'm like trying different brands is like is it compatible with silk so there's like uh, dyes that way but there's also natural dyes which is such a longer process of just like boiling the ingredient to extract like the dye and then doing the whole like process with the quills. So it's like an extra like two, three hour process when you're doing it naturally. But there's um, such a variation in color when you do it naturally that it's almost, it, it's so much more worth it um, to where, you know, synthetic dyes, it's like that solid color and then no variations because um, it's a product at that point, you know, the dye is. So there's a bit more um, beauty in the natural, nat the natural dyes um, interacting with quills. All right, so we got time for maybe one or two more questions. Anyone else have a question? Yes. <laughs> JC, are you going to start working He's with sandwiched porcupine? sandwiched between <laughs> us. He should be. I don't know. Why aren't you I doing it I haven't seen one on the side of the road yet, you know? <laughs> I think you should do a mural of a porcupine. Yeah, a porcupine. It's <laughs> funny. He'll come into Redline and he'll find quills like scattered throughout Redline from my studio and he'll bring it back in my studio and hand me a single quill. I'm like, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> found one. I guess I mean I don't I don't have all the knowledge of what that would entail and um, for the people my ancestors but I think for me it's just a continuation of those geometric shapes to me I just see it as as dimensions and um, and for me to incorporate it into my works is just an extension and continuation of that and and I do think of it as sacred geometry too um, but more or less, it's, 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 for me, it's like simplifying forms and being able to communicate in this way that's um, not as, like, realistic, you know, because I, I can paint realistically, but I'm not going to, you know, like, for me, it's like, might as well just take a picture. And so it's more or less like style for me now. Um, how do I continue these geometric shapes and give um, these figures or portraits a dimension? And, um, and, and just kind of, again, pay respects to uh, rug weavers because um, that's kind of just what they did. And, um, and so for me, like when I paint, it, I see it as weavings. So a lot of my canvases, I don't stretch until after I'm done with the painting. But I'm learning that's not the right thing to do. <laughs> so uh, even though I like it, because it's, it's just, it's beautiful because I let the paint drip off the canvas and it just looks great. Um, so when I wrap it around stretchers, it doesn't have that energy, like the expression that I'm looking for. So, but yeah, back to the question, I, I, I don't know, you know, oh, oh, good God. question. So seriously, um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm being serious because to me it could mean anything to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I can only speak for myself. And, uh, and that's just how I speak is through those shapes. For me, I would say yes, um, because of, and that's why I took on Buddhism, because I read a book about the comparison of Tibetan Buddhism with Navajo culture, mm -hmm. and how those stories kind of correlated in the different, the, the way the 
geographically the environments were structured and how they related to that environment and how their stories of creation and their different gods kind of were very similar to ours as Navajo people. And so for me, like, I felt like there was a connection there. Um, and um, so like, and, and that's why, again, the, the, the sand paintings, it's speaking about impermanence. And that's what Buddhists talk about too, is the impermanent nature of our existence. And so like, that's kind of what I'm latching onto and trying to replicate within my work, but also just kind of speak from it, from my identity as a Navajo person. Mm -hmm. So we are out of time. Please give a round of applause for these amazing artists. And again, the show is open until May 21st. Please tell your family and friends to come check it out. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.